We're going to just get started here. My name is Tina Shao. I am a uh, program manager for the digital growth program um, from the Google News Initiative. Uh, I started at Google about a year ago, but previously worked in strategy at ABC News, covering anything uh, that would uh, that could grow the audience of ABC. So everything from broadcast to streaming to digital, uh, socials, uh, any kind of larger audience growth strategies that we had. I worked really closely with our analytics teams and our audience development teams on. Um, and I joined Google about a year ago. So I work on the digital growth program, as I mentioned, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But I scale and innovate on all of our content offerings that we have across the digital growth program. And Abby, over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Jingris. I am the director of consulting services at News Revenue Hub. Um, so I work with newsrooms all over the U.S. Um, and some international um, to help them grow their audiences and their membership programs. I know we have quite a few hub folks in the chat. I saw Kyle from CT Mir, some Carolina Public Press people, um, and several others. So it's great to see you all. Um, I'm based in New Hampshire. I don't think I saw anyone else in New Hampshire in the chat. So hello from New England. Um, and before I worked at News Revenue Hub, uh, I was an audience editor for several years at Outside Magazine. So um, I actually did this work of growing audiences myself, and now I help newsrooms do it um, from afar. But I'm really excited to be here um, and to talk, chat with you all today. Fantastic. Um, so the Google News Initiative is Google's uh, effort to support a robust and healthy news industry. And we do that through three specific ways. Um, one, through the, uh, the advancing the practice of quality journalism, which I saw in the chat that someone had attended a workshop with Mary Nahorniak. So that is part of um, our journalism resources that we have. So we have a suite of resources for journalists. Um, so covering topics like misinformation, um, digital, uh, digital reporting, and lots of other resources. Uh, second, we have our strengthening involving publisher business models. That's what I work in, and that's what this workshop will cover. And then lastly, we have building a collaborative and global news community. So as I mentioned, um, we're here today to talk about evolving uh, publisher business models, and specifically uh, through the digital growth program. That's the program I'm on, we have free training, consulting, and support to help news, uh, small and medium-sized news organizations succeed online. So I'll share a number of uh, links and other resources that we offer through the Digital Growth Program. And if you ever have any thoughts or ideas, feel free to, um, I'll share my email at the end of the workshop and you, you'll be able to follow up. I also want to share that we have a free Google Analytics add-on tool. So this is for my audience development friends and, uh, and that are here today. Um, if you have Google Analytics, this is one thing that is not quite known about Google Analytics was that it was built for advertisers and not publishers. Um, so we, uh, the Google team created this tool called News Consumer Insights, which basically adds, uh, works as an add-on. Um, you connect your Google Analytics data to it, and it creates a like publisher-friendly version of News Consumer Insights. So it will give you actionable rep recommendations based on uh, your Google Analytics data and what audience segments you have. Great, and I'll toss it over to Abby to talk a little bit about the News Revenue Hub. Yeah, just a little bit about us um, before we get started. Um, some of you may already be familiar with our work, but the News Revenue Hub is an organization that um, is like part tech company, part consulting services. Um, so a lot of nonprofit newsrooms in particular, if they have donation programs, you probably recognize our checkout page. Um, so part of what we do is help news organizations um, process donations and organize all that data so that they can effectively um, grow their membership programs, reach out to their donors, um, steward them and maintain them and just grow that revenue stream. Um, we are really focused towards making the journalism industry more sustainable and helping newsrooms find sustainable reader based sources of revenue. Uh, so that's part of our work. The other part of our work that I am more involved in is our consulting services. Um, so we go in um, to newsrooms and help them grow their membership programs, grow their audience programs, and kind of tap in where um, newsrooms may not have the in-house support. Um, so a lot of you are probably in small newsrooms where um, you just may not have the budget um, 
currently or or maybe you will in the future for like a full audience team or a full membership team. Um, and so you may not have someone in-house who can be dedicated to focusing on search traffic or focusing on fundraising 24 seven. Um, so we come in and help newsrooms do the things that they may not be able to do currently without us. Um, and our goal is really to um, teach newsrooms so that eventually they can do those things on their own. Um, they're able to hire folks and they feel set up for success um, and so that's a little bit about what I do and why I'm here with Tina today. Fabulous. And we do love the News Revenue Hub. This is one of many workshops that Google and the News Revenue Hub have worked on together. This is the first time that Abby and I are co-presenting. So we're excited to share all these lovely insights with you guys today. Yeah. So that before we start, we want to know from you guys why you attended this work, why you chose this workshop to attend, but in general, why you want to grow your audience. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll here in the chat. Um, so if you go to your right side of your screen um, under breakout and Q&A and polls, there should be a live poll there now that says, why do you want to grow your audience? So we'd love for you guys to all submit. And don't worry, when you type it in there, it won't show up immediately. I will show, launch them all once we have uh, a couple of folks that have answered it. Here on the right here, we have... We provide really good information about navigating healthcare, more people should know, build more donors, become more effective at getting the news to an audience. Top of funnels become more difficult than ever, especially to get the right readers, um, become an authority on our niche topic, demonstrate to our investors uh, they're reaching disconnected citizens, getting more donations, no better measure of meeting our mission, share our journalism with as many people as possible, increase revenues, um, change thinking about civics and sustainability, promote societal change, help more people better understand uh, sustainability, more access to high quality in-depth reporting, grow the impact of our journalism. Uh, love to see a great metric in here. We have 47% market, market penetration in the local community. So how do we get that number higher? Um, the news report is important, grow it to get more donors more audience members, more visibility, more impact, more donors, grow our impact. So overall, we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of similar trends here on the impact of our journalism, how this is part of the core mission of journalism, but also on sustainability, on how it is part of the funnel to become a donor. Uh, does that sound about right to everyone? All right, I'm going to now share back to the presentation. All right. So we talked a little bit about why you guys want to grow your audience specifically, but I think one of the hardest things when it comes to uh, growing your audience is specifically what the different steps to actually getting there are. And so Abby and I are going to walk through a couple of different uh, ways that you can grow your audience, but I want to frame that in the larger picture of the overall strategy that you guys are implementing as part of your newsrooms. Um, it's really challenging a lot of times to know how you guys are doing or specifically like uh, we have a lot of publishers at the Google News Initiative that will come to us and say, how do I how do I know I'm doing good? How do I know that this metric is right or that I'm on the right track? Um, so part of that is the first step in our how to grow your audience, which is the scoring. So we have a tool uh, through the Google News Initiative called the User Funnel Diagnostic. And basically what this tool does is it is an aggregate of of industry benchmarks that we've gotten from our work with thousands of publishers and diving into that performance will help you guide your next steps. And so basically this tool is geared more towards reader revenue. There is specific metrics that we have for donations as well. Um, but it, the first part of the metrics that we have are for audience development specifically. Um, so it compares your performance against other publications with uh, uh, across 11 different metrics. So what you'll do is you'll add your publications data in across all of those metrics and we'll cover the metrics in this session as well. Um, you'll then see how you compare against your region, uh, specifically in North America, and then you'll get a scorecard. And that scorecard will also give you a list of tactics um, to uh, to give you some advice on how to and actual recommendations to actually make those uh, metrics improve. Um, so what that will look like, here's an example of a scorecard. So what you'll see here is that uh, you'll get either a green, a yellow or red, depending on how your uh, metric lines up with the industry benchmark. So if you're over 10%, you'll get this green dot. Um, if you're within 10%, high, low, you'll get a yellow dot. And if you're less than 10% below, you'll get a red dot. And so 
it doesn't necessarily mean that any of these are good or bad. It's mostly just where you are sitting relative to the industry. And so this can also help because uh, this is just a way for you to grade your own performance, right? If you want to focus on one metric in particular, you can say, oh, well, the ones that I'm in red, I want to make sure that I'm at least meeting the industry benchmark in. So I will drop the link for this tool in the chat, um, and I'll also include it at the very end of our presentation. Uh, but when you go deeper into the metrics that you specifically have, it will also offer tactics and ideas on how you can improve that metric. But great. So let's say you go through all of that um, and you get to your your next step here, which is selecting. So choosing which metrics to focus on. Um, so there's a lot of metrics that you can look at in the audience world. So the real question is, which metrics should I focus on? So when you talk about growing your audience, there's really two categories that you're probably saying when you're saying you're you want to grow. You either want to grow your new readers or you want to grow the loyalty of your current readers. Um, and so on your new readers, you're talking about all your different traffic sources. So search, social, referrals, um, market penetration can also help you figure out how much left of your market you want to reach. And then the second bucket being the loyalty of your readers. So if your goal is to grow your audience in the sense of their loyalty and how many times they come to you, how frequently they come to you, how long they, how long of time they spend with you, that can also ladder up into uh, your into the funnel in terms of uh, ad revenue as well as uh, reader revenue. And so once you've selected those metrics, and we'll go back to those, and you guys will actually get to vote on which metrics you want to you want us to cover today. Let's we'll talk about strategy. So part of uh, now that you've done all the hard work, right? Picked all your metrics, figured out which uh, things are most important to you, and you've also picked a target. Let's say you want to grow to uh, ten thousand more readers. Um, then you can pick where you want to grow that audience. So let's say you want a certain number of that to come from social, search, and referrals. Here's the next main next step, which is identifying which specific tactics will help get you there and assigning the right people to work on those tactics to make sure that they carry through to your newsroom. So this is a really critical step that a lot of publishers don't necessarily like it. We don't teach this exactly of what to do when we come when it comes to growing any of these metrics but this is a critical step to actually make those actions show up in the in our newsrooms so with that we'll go over what metrics you want us to cover so i'm going to launch another poll in our slido here um, and you guys will be able to choose between all of these options um which of which of them you want us to cover today give me one moment here and you can choose up to three and we will cover three of them here. So the poll is now live. So feel free to choose three that you wanna see. Of 60% voting on newsletter subscription rate. I know that'll make Abby very happy. Um, <laughs> we have 50% on search and 50, 45% on social. Um, so now I'm going to toss it over to Abby to cover um, newsletters, and I'm going to work in the background very quickly to put together this deck for you guys uh, that we're going to cover here today. So let me just share my screen real quick for Abby. All right, take it away. Awesome. So I'm very happy you all chose this um, because if you hadn't chosen it, Tina and I were like, we're going to show it to them anyways, because we think it's very important. Um, so people who have worked with me at The Hub know that we are big, big fans of your newsletters and your email list. We think it's a really critical place for loyalty to develop. So of course, we want to grow your overall audience, um, those casual readers that we're going to get from search and social primarily, which we'll be talking about next. Um, but newsletters are really where we can get people to start developing a habit, um, start to become more loyal, more engaged. Um, and hopefully at some point, that's where we're going to see the most conversions for membership or just for dollars to your organization in general, whether that be through events or other revenue streams. Um, so your newsletter is really, really critical. Um, and it's like the, one of the only audience places where you have a direct connection to your reader, right? Like through social or through search, they might be finding you by happenstance. Um, you know, you may not have a ton of actual data on who these people are. They might just be an anonymous username. Um, so email is really huge. People are buying in to like get direct communications from you. Um, and so we really want to focus on your newsletter subscription rate, which is getting people onto your list so that you can start communicating with them, tell them more about your organization 
and hopefully eventually like get money from them in some way. So the best way to drive your newsletter subscription rate is organically on your site um, using light boxes. We call them calls to action at News Revenue Hub. Um, but these are just places on your site where you are promoting your newsletter, promoting your email list and giving people a simple, straightforward way to sign up. Um, so this is an example from Montana Free Press that kind of checks all the best practices that we really like to see. So first of all, it's placed prominently um, on every page. In this case, it's a pop-up. Um, it's on mobile. It's on desktop. Um, and it's very apparent to readers. It catches their eyes. Um, and it's just prominent color. Um, you'll also note that it's descriptive. So you can see in the description of this call to action um, you know exactly what you are signing up for as a reader. There's no ambiguity in terms of what emails you're going to get, how often you're going to get them as a user. I know exactly what I'm signing up for. Some people might be okay with a daily newsletter. Other people may not be. Um, and so you want to make sure they know when they're signing up, if your email is every single day, multiple times a day, or if it's just once a week, so they can know what they're signing up for. Um, and then last but not least, this is a one-click um, sign up and it's very simple. You just enter your email address and you click subscribe and that's all you have to do. We want to make this process as frictionless as possible so that we can get as many emails as possible. Um, and this has pretty much been best practices for um, several years now, but it's still really common to go to websites and see email or newsletter signups that have like six or seven fields to them. Um, and so they're asking for a lot of information and there's a lot of chances there for someone to drop off, not finish the form and not end up giving you their email address. So we just want to make it as seamless and straightforward as possible um, and push it as often as we can. Fabulous. Yeah. And one other recommendation that we have from these consumer insights, which um, that's the Google Analytics add on I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. I also just dropped the link in the chat there. Um, the best part about this Montana free press button is just how clickable this button is. It's orange. So red, orange, yellow, this kind of contrasting color, warm tone buttons do phenomenally well for click through rates. Some of these buttons can get up to 70% of click through rates, but the average in the publishing industry is only about 5%. Um, so making sure that you're following those best practices, as Abby mentioned, um, is really important to getting folks to actually click through on them. The other small, two small things that this button also does that's really great is that it has rounded edges. It's a little hard to see in this presentation, but that also makes the button a little bit more attractive. And the second is that using just one word, strong call to action. So something like subscribe, join, um, something that is very short and specifics. Uh, there, you'll be surprised how many buttons you'll see where there's a lot of text in them. You want to make it super clear what the what the reader is going to get. And we have a question here from Jessica. Is it better to make it one click but not allow people to opt into specific newsletters or let people pick specific newsletter segments? Yeah, so that's a great question, Jessica. Usually you can have a page on your website that's kind of like a newsletter, like landing page or center almost where people could opt into multiple newsletters. For these kinds of calls to action that we're talking about, typically it would be like one per each newsletter product that you have. Um, so this is directing people to a specific newsletter from Montana Free Press, but um, you might have multiple. Um, so maybe you have a daily news newsletter um, and that call to action shows up on news articles. Um, but maybe you have another one that's like an arts and events newsletter and that shows up on arts and events pages. So um, we try to kind of like tailor them to specific newsletter products. Um, but then definitely you can have like a landing page on your website, you can have preferences center in your email service provider um, so people can sign up for multiple things. Fabulous. And Mary asks, do you recommend separate audiences for donors and readers? We don't typically. Um, with our technology, we can kind of filter out donors from readers if we want to communicate to them in a different way or send some, some messages and others not send the messages. Um, so we have them all in one audience, but segment them out. Um, if you don't have the capability to do that, um, you may want to have them be separate audiences. But typically, we try to just have like one audience in your email service provider that has everyone. And then you can use we use MailChimp. So it's like groups or segments to kind of split people up that way. But they all exist under one audience. 
Yeah, and one thing that we've seen publishers do uh, really well in is to also offer member specific newsletters. So newsletters that you could only get by subscribing. This is actually a really big part of the Atlantic's overall membership strategy. So that is also another offering that you can uh, you could have as part of your membership program if you have one. And Abby, give me your advice on experimentation. I know that like, uh, how do I know that it's a 50% light box, if it's a 25% light box? How do I know what works best? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, like I said, um, I think this design from Montana Free Press is great. It kind of follows all of our best practices. Um, I'm not sure when they set it up, but I would say, let's say Montana Free Press set this up this month. It's probably doing really well for them because it's new. Um, but if you have the same call to action on your site for a while, um, people who visit you regularly are going to have, you know, some blinders on. They're going to get used to seeing that little pop up in the corner that they immediately X out of or whatever it may be. Um, so I encourage you to regularly test and change things around on your site. Um, some different things you can test is like the design and location of calls to action. You can test, um, you know, different button colors. Like Tina was saying, like, you know, we typically advise like a warm action color, but maybe your readers respond to like a hot pink um, button rather than a red button or something like that. So there are so many things you can test from language to how frequently the call to action appears if it's a pop up. Um, and so sometimes just changing it up um, can boost your list growth. Um, but we encourage you to just test and test and test um, to see what your audience best responds to. And then make sure if you've had something up for a while, um, it might be getting a little stagnant. So maybe try to change it up um, at least every few months just to make sure that you um, are constantly re-engaging readers who are visiting your site regularly. Yeah, and another, that is super helpful advice and I, it's always funny to think about what certain groups might prefer over others. And so another way that you can also check to see if you're doing all these best practices is to go on your news website, pull up the Montana Free Presses and yours and see what the differences between those two are. So these kind of best practices that Abby just outlined um, in this specific slide, you can check for your own news organization. Is my newsletter widget placed prominently? Is it placed in the nav bar and the header and the light box? Is it, does it clearly communicate the topic and frequency of the newsletter? And lastly, is it that one click and contrasting button to make it really easy to sign up? So whether you're at the very beginning of your newsletter journey or at the very end, you can use this advice to see if you're, you're checking off all the boxes. Great. So that wraps for newsletters. Um, and if you have any other questions, please make sure to uh, put them in the chat or uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about search. Um, so this is a really exciting topic from the Google News Initiative. So I'm super excited to talk about it with you guys. And when we talk about search specifically uh, at Google, we typically are talking about showing up in Google News. Um, and there is some traffic that is news on search, but it's a really small amount. And so most of the time when you are trying to appear, you're trying to appear in Google News. Um, and that can help you reach new audiences and attract really avid news readers to your site. And all the information I'll be sharing today is from the developer blog, so it's all available publicly online. Um, when, but when you search for a topic that's in the news, the Google algorithms basically organize specific stories and articles based on factors like relevance, prominence, and authority of the publisher specifically. So Google automatically considers any content published on the web eligible for inclusion in Google News. So there's not necessarily any like opt-in or any like thing that you have to apply for, it will just automatically uh, be considered. And if you'd like to learn more, um, please visit our Publisher Center, which is the interface that we have that helps publishers submit, manage, and like uh, their manage your content and brand within Google News. Um, so this is one Q&A link that I'll drop in the chat that is really helpful on um, rankings and Google News in general. Um, and it also has links through to Publisher Center. But generally, if you have any questions about search or news, you can mostly find it in there. But in general, one of the reasons also why you want to look, why you want to grow your audience from search is that people that are on search are looking very intentionally, right? They're looking for something very specific. Um, if I'm searching black pants, uh, best top 10 best black pants, that's where I'm most likely to be farther along in my journey and I'm more interested in that topic than say, um, someone that's at the very beginning of that journey, or they might not be um, aware that they're part of that journey quite yet. But in general, th there's a lot of best practices you can follow to be included and make it really easy for uh, the Google web crawler to find you. Um, and the first of that is making sure that the 
uh, information that you provide is about your author and about your publication is really clear. Um, visitors to your site, they want to trust and understand who publishes the information. Um, and news sources and Google wants to reward news organizations that make that information really clear. Um, there's a number of signals that uh, the Google News web crawler looks at to be able to decide where it uh, where it should place it in the rankings. And this is a big one. So whether the information is presented very clearly. So what that might look like is is the information is the is the author of the article very clear? So as you can see, this is actually my coworker, Natalie, uh, when she used to work at the journal. So you can see her name is really clearly listed underneath the title of the article. The date of the publication of the article is also really clear. Um, and if you click through on her name, you can actually see um, information about her, information about the journal, information about the network behind the content, um, and you and that is one of the best practices that we can advise because again making sure that all that information is super clear and upfront as well as a way to contact um the publisher so in this case you can't quite see it too much but there's a little uh little envelope button underneath natalie's profile so there's a really clear way to communicate these are all signals that google looks for to be able to determine whether this information is really clear and transparent um, some other best practices you can follow are placing the title of the article in prominently above the article body and making sure that all your article titles are between two and 22 words. So while Google can't guarantee that they'll show your site's articles, these suggestions can help increase the chances that the web crawler extracts the correct information. Um, Abby, anything else on this? No, um, just in general, um, you know, like Tina already said, like being as clear as you possibly can um, and being as trustworthy as you possibly can is like really key with search. Um, and so you want to make sure your headlines are to the point and accurately reflect what the story is about, like a headline that is really well optimized for a search query, but does not reflect what your story is about. It might get you traffic for a little bit, but then you're going to get deranked as soon as the algorithm or readers figure out that your story isn't helpful. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you are really prioritizing accuracy um, and being as clear and transparent as possible um, as much as you can. Fabulous. And then second is to avoid duplicate content. So um, Google News overall seeks to reward independent original journalistic content. So they do that by giving credit to the originating publisher as both the users and publishers would prefer. And so this does mean that Google tries to not allow duplicate content. So things like scraped content, rewritten, co mildly rewritten content, mildly republished content uh, to perform better than the original content. And so there's a couple of ways that you can actually make uh, make this make this a little bit better for the existing content that you do have that is original um, is that you can cite the URL as the canonical source. So this is uh, on the right here what that link might look like if you're citing that original article as the original. Um, and Abby, let, tell us a little bit about what canonical URLs are like and what how did that plays into the search. Yeah. Um, so Nicole just asked this in the chat, you know, do we notice issues if you co-publish with partners? Um, this is where the canonical URL is really critical. Um, you just want to make sure that, for instance, if you are sharing your content with other publishers for them to republish, you want to make sure that they are basically telling Google, hey, like this organization published this first. So if you see both of our links, there should get the priority because it was the original content. Um, and so it's, we love like sharing content. I think that's great for readers. Um, and it can also be a source of revenue depending on your system. Uh, but you just want to make sure that you are using those canonical URLs um, and asking orgs to link back to you if they're sharing your content so that um, as in as many ways as possible, you're telling Google that you're the originator of the content. And same goes if you are posting republished content, you want to make sure that you are referring um, Google back to the original publisher. Fabulous. And lastly, uh, making use of the tools that Google also has. And I'll drop the links to these in the chat. Um, but Abby, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you've used Search Console and Google Trends in the in the newsroom? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a lot of orgs, if they are thinking about search, they might be thinking about it, um, you know, when they're about to publish a story, they might do a quick Google and add some keywords to their headlines. And that's great. We definitely want to see that happening with every story. But it's also important to go back after the fact and learn from what worked and what did it. And so Search Console is really useful for that. 
Um, I would love to see more publishers in there checking um, their performance in Search Console more regularly, um, especially if maybe you had a debate with the headline between which version of a keyword or which keyword to use. Maybe you were debating between spelling out your state um, or just doing the abbreviation of your state. Um, and maybe you were like, it's a toss up. We aren't sure which one would perform better. And so you just pick one and you publish. Um, you can go back into Search Console a few days later and see what search, um, search queries people were using that led them to that story. And maybe you find out that you picked the right version of the keyword and it can say the same, or maybe you pick the wrong one um, and you can revise that headline to help boost that story um, after the fact. And so I think it's just a good best practice to go back and learn from what has worked and what hasn't and make sure you're just constantly learning and revising your strategy um, to just continue to, again, better serve readers. Because this all goes back to not just trying to get more traffic from search or rank better, but it's about trying to get your content in, as, in front of as many people as possible um, because you think you have answers to their questions. Yeah, and Abby, I think you're highlighting on something really important here, which is making it part of your newsroom processes, right? Making sure you're actually going back and checking to see what that progress is. Sometimes, uh, you know, it, w given that journalism is a reflective industry, it can be a little bit challenging with how fast the news moves sometimes to see whether those things actually work or not. So baking into part of your newsroom processes to do that check and make sure that you're updating things based on what you're finding in console and trends can really uh, can really help your newsroom understand better what performs on search. Um, how do we get Google to include our site in Google News search returns? Uh, do all of these things that we just talked about, uh, for sure. And also, if you create a, uh, a profile in Publisher Center, there's a lot of great resources in Publisher Center. I'll make sure to, uh, to link it in the chat again. Uh, but basically, there isn't a application process necessarily to be included on um, Google News. Anything that's on the open web can be considered part of Google News. Um, and so making sure that you follow these best practices and making it really easy for the Google crawler to find that specific information so that it can assess that you are a trustworthy and transparent source will help you in your rankings. Um, and John and Andrew, if you guys want to shoot me a direct message afterwards, we can try to see if there's anything specific that you guys are missing in your process. Fabulous. So last but not least, social. Uh, so I'll toss it over to Abby to chat about this. Yeah, so um, social is definitely very important for your audience growth strategy. We know our readers are on social platforms um, and depending on if you're trying to target maybe a certain age demographic um, or reach a certain niche audience, um, different social platforms can be really critical for you. Um, and so every platform, of course, has its own rules, its own algorithms, its own strategies that need to be taken into account. Um, when it comes to planning your content for social. Um, but there are generally a few best practices that we can follow to try to improve our presence on social media um, and just continue to grow our audience there. So first and foremost, we want our content to be engaging, of course. Um, we want that on our sites as well and in our newsletters. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are using engaging formats on platforms and catering to what those platforms are currently interested in and pushing. Um, and so this is kind of the downside of social media, whereas like search, the, the things that work have been pretty consistent over the years. Um, with social, as we know, the algorithms are always changing. Um, Facebook or Meta, I guess, would decide that we want to do something different with Instagram now. And so they might be prioritizing video or stories over static photos. Um, and so you do have to stay kind of up to date on what the different platforms are promoting at this point. Um, this screenshot or GIF is an example from the New York Times. It was a story that they used. And I think it's a great example of being really interactive and engaging on different fronts. So you can see that it's dynamic, it moves, it has links um, further into the story. They had a poll for readers. Um, and so they were just really engaging in multiple different ways um, and just trying to capture attention as much as possible. Um, another tip that we really want to follow is making social more um, two way rather than one way communication. So something we see a lot is that newsrooms will just be using social media as a way to push out their content, push out stories. Um, and that's it. And sometimes that is just due to the fact that that's all you have the bandwidth for. You may not have a dedicated audience editor, a dedicated social media manager who can spend their day, you know, reading tweets, reading Facebook comments and replying. Um, but since social traffic can be so variable, you may have less control over it. 
Um, what you do have control over is that two-way communication and using every social post as an opportunity to engage with readers, to build their trust, to answer their questions and to see what they're passionate about. Um, so this is an example from the Oakland side where they, you know, had done a typical tweet from a news organization status with a story link um, and a reader had asked a follow up question. And, you know, they took that opportunity to answer and, and give them with more information. Um, and so, yes, that's one reader. That's only one tweet in the scheme of things. That's not very much. But that reader probably trusts the Oakland side just a little bit more. Um, other readers probably saw that interaction and it improved their um, perspective of the Oakland side. And so any of those things that you can do um, to just engage with readers and make those platforms more about engagement um, will only serve to help your organization. And then um, last but not least, if you want to click next, um, we want to just make sure that we're matching our time and our resources to our goals. Um, so if you are regularly in your analytics, um, you probably have a good sense of where your traffic comes from. Um, and so social, of course, is only a chunk of where your readers are coming from. And when you get into that and look even deeper, you see, you know, a typical breakdown. Probably most of your readers are coming from Facebook, I would bet, um, with then smaller chunks coming from Twitter and Instagram. And then, you know, depending on your organization, could be Reddit, could be LinkedIn, um, TikTok, maybe various different platforms. Um, but a lot of times we see that orgs, you know, are dedicating their time and their, their manpower um, in, in a way that doesn't align with where their traffic is coming from. So you probably get a ton of traffic from search. Do you have someone dedicated in your newsroom to search um, or even partially dedicated? Um, or maybe right now half your traffic's from Facebook, but you want to decrease that and you want to see more traffic coming in from Twitter and Instagram. Um, if that's your goal, that's great. Um, but are you then accordingly dedicating someone's time to spending more time on Twitter and Instagram and less on Facebook to grow those shares? Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind that, um, you know, whatever breakdown you're interested in, that's going to depend on you and your goals. Um, but you just want to make sure that you um, are accordingly changing how you're spending your energy. Fabulous. Awesome. Oh, and let me reshare this. Give me one moment. And I know we are coming up almost on time here, but I want to share some resources that we have from the Google News Initiative. If you want to learn more about um, audience development or if you have, say, like a new person that's joining your team um, and you want to get them up to speed on uh, audience development in general, um, we have all sorts of audience development tactics and uh, resources. Um, I'm pasting a giant list here that has all of these. Um, so all of these links that's on this slide right here, uh, you can see in the first link that's there, the odd dev resources. So that's our one pager. Um, so all of our workshops and playbooks are available there. And we're also offering um, one hour uh, free office hours with industry leading coaches and experts. Um, and that sign up link is also in that one pager as well. And we just launched a best practices workshop series. We actually just had our audience development one last week, but you can still watch it on demand. Um, and th that link is also in that list of links that I just provided. Uh, but basically those are just success stories with uh, publishers that we've worked with across audience development, reader revenue, ad revenue, product and data. I will be hosting the product one in a couple of weeks. So if you like this workshop, you can definitely join that one and it will be, it will cover many similar topics since the first part of product is audience development. Um, Tony asks, is there a certification for this topic? Um, so if you follow uh, those odd dev links that I just shared, that first First one there if you go to our workshop series if you watch all three workshops in the series um, and then shoot an email to the email that's listed in there i think it's gni digital growth program at, at google.com um, you will actually get a certificate uh, uh, for completing that course can you take a technical question why would i see a huge difference on time on page depending on the google analytics view do you want to handle that one tina Yeah, I think I'm uh, without knowing the specific audience, it, it might be a little bit challenging to understand specifically if it's a huge difference based on the view. I'm assuming that means you might be looking at different audience segments. So like different audience segments might be looking at things or, for example, if you're looking at it by device, that also might be it. I'm not specifically sure. But Tony, if you can shoot me a note, if you can include any screenshots just so that we can understand a little bit more what you're asking about. 
Um, Kanani, I hope I'm saying that correctly. She asked, um, how do you get larger newsrooms invested in audience work, especially when we don't currently have designated staff for all those areas? It's really hard um, getting buy-in, even in smaller newsrooms can be really difficult. Um, I think it's really important to translate like data and analytics into like real world users and readers, especially for like reporters and editors who might be like, that's not my lane. Like I just write stories or I just go out and report and like, I don't need to care about the data or the page views. Um, and so I think just translating that for them as much as possible and getting them invested and being like, Hey, you wrote this killer investigation. That's so, so good. Um, but because your headline didn't have keywords in it, no one read it. And don't you want people to read it because you put all that time and energy into it and like it could change people's lives. Um, and so I think as much as possible, just trying to translate for people, why they are doing the things you're asking them to do when it comes to like writing better headlines or, um, you know, posting on Twitter or whatever it may be. Um, so translating that why for people can be really important. Um, also, I've seen sometimes incentives can help. Um, so I used the example of Montana Free Press earlier. We did um, SEO work with them last year where we helped them, you know, figure out um, a new workflow to start brainstorming and workshopping headlines for every story. And something that helped them get by in their newsroom was doing like a monthly contest where they had like an actual gift card that they gave away to the person who had, you know, that they determined to be like the most participatory in workshops or the most helpful or the most engaged. Um, so that was like a fun way that they got buy in from their whole newsroom. Um, so sharing the why, um, getting people engaged in fun ways. Um, and then I think, you know, celebrating wins with folks, letting them know that that headline that they spent time workshopping translated into that story, reaching more people. Um, so letting them know that their work is paying off um, and that there's a reason that you're asking them to do those things can really help. Yeah, I love that point on celebrating wins. I think that's such an important one. When I was at ABC, um, we had a Slack channel called Wins. And so every time like someone, exactly to what Abby was saying, like if they'd worked out the headline and it resulted in an increase, then they would post it in that Wins Slack. And so it was also worked as a way of like documenting all of the different ways that people were testing things or trying things to get new results. Um, and I think especially given how fast news cycles can move sometimes or how much work really just goes into how uh, each article, just taking that time to celebrate all of the different work that's being done to make that final product and really, uh, really encourage that overall uh, audience centric newsroom. Mini topic, best way to seek feedback from readers, both website and newsletter. Um, so uh, one thing that was interesting from our product lab, we had a publication uh, inside higher ed. So they're a uh, a small publisher that is focused on uh, higher ed professionals specifically. And so they actually sent out a newsletter ask, um, just uh, asking whether people would uh, fill in a, a 10 question survey that they had. And they were shocked to receive like 2,500 responses within a week. Um, so I think one thing that I'm always, uh, I'm always surprised by with uh, newsrooms is just how much your audience really does want to help you and advocate for you and do things with you. And all you have to do is ask but a lot of times, um, you know, especially our newsrooms don't always ask audiences directly. And so making that ask is really important. Yeah. And off of that, too, I think making the ask in general, that's something like you'd be surprised how many people don't do that and don't ask for feedback from their readers. So that's a huge, important step to take. But also, um, you know, this kind of goes back to like what I was saying with social media and making it a two way communication um, place. Um, you want to do that with reader feedback too. So if you're just asking readers for their feedback and then not actually implementing it or making changes that they have requested, um, then there's not really a point in asking for that feedback, right? So if your readers tell you that they care about a certain area of coverage or they don't like your site design, they find it hard to use on mobile or whatever, um, you want to make sure that you're asking that for a reason and that you're prepared to like make changes. Um, obviously, you don't want to make changes because one person has a complaint. But if your readers are sharing, you know, if there's a trend in that feedback, um, it's great to then implement it. And then you can go back to your readers and say, hey, we asked for this feedback. You provided it and we made these changes. And again, that's just going to serve to grow loyalty, grow trust uh, and just make that relationship even better. Um, Bob had asked comments, pros and cons in this polarized world. Um, I feel like that could be its own session in and of itself, Bob. Um, but I would say I, as someone who used to have to moderate comments um, and the pros and cons that came with that, that job, um, you know, I think comments can be a really great place to um, have conversations, to grow trust, um, but they can also be a really toxic 
bad plays. Um, if you host them on your site, it can be a huge burden for your site bandwidth um, and can slow down your load times, all those sorts of things. Um, I would say like my main caveat for comments is like, if you are going to use them either on site or engage in them on social media and other places, you need to be prepared to moderate them um, and make them a non-toxic place. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of orgs, um, you know, didn't used to do, still don't do, don't have a great moderation strategy, don't have someone dedicated to be in those comment sections all day. Um, and that's really what it requires. So I think if you are thinking about comments, um, I would say they can be really um, interesting places, but they do require that moderation. Fabulous. We are a couple minutes over, but thank you guys so much for joining us. And again, uh, my email and Abby's email will pop in the chat right now. Um, but again, if you have any other questions, please feel free to follow up with us. But thank you guys so much for joining.